Hey everybody! Welcome to Tradecraft Tuesday. Uh, this is a this is a show where uh, every week we expose hacker techniques um, that everyone can use for both offense and defense. So we try to uh, look into what hackers and attackers have been doing. Uh, we try to expose their techniques and say, "Hey, look! This is what they're doing. If you want to defend against it, here's how you can defend against it." Um, on the other side of the ball, if you're offensive and you're doing uh, pen tests and the like, here's how you can use this to your advantage to you know kind of gain. A leg up on everybody so um, we do the show most every Tuesday right here um, we're now on YouTube so we used to be on blab but um, YouTube is is the best so we also have a slack so if you want to uh, if you want to join in and you want to ask questions um, definitely join the slack if you want to talk about stuff extended with other people after the show or if you just have general comments or uh, things that we should cover Definitely hit up the Slack and um, yeah, hope to see you there. Uh, so if you um, if you have any issues with the Google Hangout, um, or please let us know. Um, you know we're still trying to get the kinks worked out, but uh, it seems so far that everything's uh, going well and, and we're not having any issues. So um, yeah, yeah. With that said, Chris, um, you know we, we got a lot of good feedback last week. It was one of our first that we actually started tying in Slack. Yeah. Uh, and live questions via Slack. So a lot of stuff came in that didn't show on the video, but people saying, hey, you know, the graphic was hanging up too long or good feedback stories that went with it and some good vignettes. So please, you know, you can still hit us up on Twitter, but we hi highly encourage you jump into our Slack if you need to. Uh, we'll tweet a link later after the show in case you're uh, not already part of it for today. Um, with that said, we, we, we chose a topic this week in kind of a, maybe a tongue-in-cheek title of mastering cyber attribution, uh, which Chris and I are both pretty sure there is no such thing as mastering cyber attribution. Um, no. <laughs> and wanted to kind of dispel maybe some of the trends we've seen, um, highlight what it looked like from a 10-year perspective, 2005, 2010, because there was a great talk at Black Hat on attribution, and follow it up with kind of a 2016 uh, closure of you know what's changed and maybe where us as an industry should be focusing our time. Um, before we jump down that route, we always start off with some news. So Chris and I are gonna fly through that, uh, which was one of the neat portions that I saw was just like last week or two weeks ago, we did an episode on uh, Ethereum and the DAO compromise, which involved hacking smart contracts. And uh, once again this week, Chris, we, we saw what smart contracts look like. There's going to continue being an issue with it or more issues. Yep, yep. So there's another issue that they uh, posted about the other day where um, if, you, if you have a wallet and you try to transfer Ethereum or you transfer Ether to someone else's wallet, um, it is possible for that attacker to basically impersonate you to your own wallet and steal all your money. So um, I don't know. It's weird. It, it's kind of like... It's kind of like you went to the store to buy something, but instead of just handing your credit card, you handed your whole wallet. So then that, <laughs> then that person just like took off with it. You know, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> how does this happen? I have no idea. But um, this this is not like we said. We did a show on it. This is not the first time. This won't be the last time. Um, they're definitely still trying to work the kinks out of this one. But it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, where where this goes next. Uh, the the next topic for news this week is the whole internet is warned. Uh, this internet of things is going to be an internet of terror. Uh, and we kind of saw it again this week with, what was it, Chris, CCTVs? Is that what it was? CCTV cameras. Yeah. 25,000 of them got pwned and are being used for DDoS. Yeah, 25,000 uh, CCTV cameras are, have been pwned. They didn't say the brand, which um, to me is kind of irritating because how do I know if I'm vulnerable, right? Like if I have a bunch of CCTV cameras, I now know that some are vulnerable, but I don't know if they're mine are, you know, so that's kind of annoying, but um, basically 25,000 of them were, were exploited and are being used to perform uh, di distributed denial of services, so um, look out, I guess. If you have CCTV cameras, pay attention and maybe somebody will say who the vendor is and then there will be a fix. So we're, we're one step closer to my toaster or my refrigerator uh, being able to take over the internet. Is that what I understand? Skynet's one step closer to yeah, I don't know. I think I think these things are so terrible that we don't have to worry about that for a long time. But we do have to worry about attackers taking them and, and using them for other things. You know, when when your when your toasters poking your coffee maker, then then you have issues. Fair enough. Alrighty, jumping into cyber attribution. 
So um, we, we always hit it at the top level, just in case we have a newer audience to InfoSec. Um, attribution in general is the process of analysis or an analyst being able to say, hey, here's a breach, here's an operation, and tying that back to the actual actors that are behind that breach or operation. So that could be Bank of America getting hit by some crimeware, or more importantly, Bank of America users, and the process of walking it back to who's ultimately responsible for those. Sometimes attribution boils down to a country. Sometimes it boils down to as nitty gritty as here's the social security numbers of the people behind this actual compromise themselves. Uh, we're gonna take a slightly different spin on it today, cover what the industry has used for attribution in the past, and then kind of weave our spin on it, what we think is the most efficient way to attribute. Because I think there is some merit to attribution, and Chris, you can bounce your ideas off me as well. But I'm not quite sure that the end goal of saying, hey, this is Joe Blow on this corner, or maybe even it's this country that's launching this crimeware, or launching this nation state uh, attack, is very important for most of us who work in the corporate world. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it as kind of like um, an onion, right? I, you can look at it on the outside. As you peel back, you learn additional things. Um, but as you start peeling it back, each layer is more and more difficult uh, to kind of take off with any kind of certainty. So, you know, you might be able to say at a high level, this breach appears to have been done by the same people who did these other breaches. Uh, and that's that's not super terrible. But once you try to say like, okay, like who is the actual human who sat behind the computer and did this and what country do they reside in? And can I say that with 100% certainty? It gets really, really difficult. So um, I guess we can just start to get into some of the different ways that you can go from a breach and try and go towards understanding who did it and uh, and then we can give our uh, basically analysis on that. Yeah, and giving credit where credit is due, uh, one of my most exciting inspirations for this was good old Greg Hoagland's uh, 2010 Black Hat presentation. Um, I think he's now at Outlier Security. And he kind of, uh, I don't whether or not he coined the idea, he made a great slide which essentially talked about this intelligence spectrum of, of attribution. And he goes from the far left, which was essentially nearly useless, to the very far right, of the nearly impossible, and he broke it down and said, hey, there's some of this information that we shouldn't care about even if we can attribute it. There's some of this information which is so darn hard, it's still probably useless, and he said there was this spectrum or you know, sweet spot in the middle that we need to focus at. So today we're really gonna hammer in on what that sweet spot is. And then, uh, you know, Chris, the first thing that comes up to mind uh, when I start thinking about attribution, email has been one, you know, that forever and a day I've seen people uh, spend a significant amount of time, but where did this email come from? Who's behind it? What they're doing? Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about like email indicators that are commonly used? Yeah, so um, a lot of people try to, um, email's a big one for like phishing campaigns. So a lot of attackers get into a network by sending emails with attachments, convincing the user to uh, download the attachment or open it or whatever. So that's generally, I guess, the first place that most people go and, and try to say, like, okay, let's figure out where this came from. Um, so a lot of the email indicators are things, um, metadata associated with where the email came from, the email address who sent it, um, the time, the language. Um, a lot of people try to do, like, analytics on, like, the subject line or some of the text in the body to try and figure out like, okay, this is a similar, we saw this similar blurb, um, so let's say that this is bad and, and let's try to, you know, blame so-and-so based on this. You know, we, we saw this was uh, uh, happygirl at gmail.com and, you know, so like, let's block that email address, things like that. Yeah, I, I think of 2005, that was probably a plenty, actually 2005, it probably was still probably a rough thing to manage but there was a lot of folks that would just flat out like headers, inspect and say, ooh, this is a domain I shouldn't have been getting anything from, or this is an internet relay um, right. that I should probably block. And we saw a lot of spam uh, solutions as well kind of using this technology. Um, so that's a good example of maybe earlier email attribution of folks saying like, ah, I know, you know, legitdomain.com doesn't actually use this mail relay. So mm -hmm. because of that attribution that this came from some alternative re relay, I'm going to take a step back, right? So that's, I think it's fair. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really hard to go from that to saying, like, 
who is the person behind this? Because like you said, like there's there's mail relays, there's anonymous mail relays where you know anybody can connect and, and send an email and say I am so and so, and it didn't necessarily come from them. Um, you know, so like figuring out who sent you an email is really hard unless it contains like a PGP signature. But last I checked, attackers aren't really doing that, so I, I don't think we have to you know worry about that. I'm going, Chris, uh, trying to see if we can pull some images to kind of highlight what we're talking about here. Um, but while we wait, I remember the segue, not only it was just the originator and the headers of the email, but it then kind of went to this next stage when it came down to your company getting targeted, uh, which was URLs, right? It was, mm -hmm. oh man, this URL is not legit. That instead of it being Google, it's G-O-O-G-1-E or something like that. And folks would, would then kind of pivot this of like, oh, not only is this actor using this mail relay, but then they would tie that extra piece of, well, here's where they were using this attachment or serving up this you know, browser exploit or something along those lines, which was another step of attribution that I saw actors take. Yeah. All right. So, so I, I think um, if, if you can't tell, what we're going to do um, is the way we kind of step through this is like we're going to go from the more vague uh, down towards the more concrete and say, okay, you know, email indicators are really big. What's the next step? And, and for us, really, the next step is uh, the metadata in the malware. Yeah, yeah. So a good example would be maybe I can't reliably track down who the actor or, you know, what the actor is thinking behind that spear phishing attempt. But he hit me up with an attachment, and this attachment had certain details in it. Right? That's what we're referring to the metadata. That's the subdata about the actual binary payload they're sending, whether that's a legit doc that has some macro in it. Um, one of the first things I started thinking about mal or with malware metadata w was things like docs. And I think more often than not, I see in the attribution world something as simple as like, uh, this word doc was last edited by this actor or by this user. Chris, mm -hmm. you familiar with that? Yeah, uh, yeah. I have a, I have an actor that I'll pull up for that one if you want oh, to nice. advance for a bit. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of, like, actual extra metadata in, like, Microsoft Office Word docs that a lot of people, I guess, don't realize is in there. So, uh, you know, in their attempts to try and make it more user-friendly and stuff, like I was saying, they, they save data in there to say, like, who last edited this? What was the name of the file? What are, um, you know, where, what was the location the file was on disk? So if someone copied it, they can say, like, oh, it was... It came from here, and now it's over here. Um, so all of those, if if you're not careful, or if the attacker is not careful, you know, leave behind lots of traces. Um, you know, think about um, a lot of people save their Word docs um, to their folder. So if you're on Windows, that's going to be something like C users, C biznet, right? So if I see a path in the Word doc that says C users, C biznet, you know, my documents foo.doc, you know, now what's what's the likelihood that CBiznet was the real person who, who made this? It, it's probably pretty high. So if you can associate things like that, then you can start to, uh, you know, go to Google and do some OSINT and say, okay, who is who is this CBiznet character? Oh, I see he's shady. He talks about tradecraft, so it must be him, right? <laughs> Clearly that's what it means. So the page I'm going to share here uh, and actually do some screen sharing was one just from what is it, two weeks ago, Chris, the DNC compromise? Yeah. Ironically, some of the attribution that uh, several companies stood behind had to do with who this file was last modified by. So here we go. I'm going to share the screen so everybody else can see this goodness. All righty. What I'm showing here is a blog by Cryptia. We'll actually deep dive into this blog in just a little bit. But one of the things that stood out, kind of a smoking gun per se, was this image here. And this image shows the author of a PDF was Warren Flood, who had claimed, and then followed up by last modified by, insert Russian name here, or yes. Cyrillic characters here. Um, you know, this is a good example that maybe if an actor yep. had actually modified this legitimate file and he was using a username on his computer that uh, was, you know, his name, Theoretically, that data could accidentally get captured. We see the separate file properties here. The title's called Promises and Proposals. Mm -hmm. The author is Blake. That author could be Kyle Hanslogan. The company could be Fubar Co. 
But in this example, they attributed that, hey, maybe the actor behind it actually left their legit name. So that's what we're talking about, of how you can use metadata, at least in something as simple as like a, uh, you know, a PDF file or a Word doc file. Uh, but Chris, metadata doesn't just stop there, does it? I mean, we just talked about PDFs as one tiny bit of metadata. What other stuff shows up in, in malware? <clears throat> oh, a lot. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that shows up in, in binaries that uh, you know people may not realize. Um, for example, if you build a binary with like Visual Studio, Visual Studio automatically puts in uh, a PDB path. So, for anybody who's not familiar, PDBs are uh, files with data. Um, that aid the debugger. So if you were going to debug that exe um, to find uh, you know, issues with it, you're going to load up the PDB and that tells the debugger, okay, this function is called this and this variable is named this. Um, so even though you wouldn't, um, analyzing in a malware sample, you wouldn't have the PDB, so you wouldn't have all that information, there's still the path there. And again, this goes back to like I was saying before, if it was in a path like something like C users, C biznet, my malware, right? Now you can say, okay, well, number one, he called this my malware. And number two, it was potentially authored by somebody who goes by C biznet. And this is actually how a lot of like malware um, get their names, right? So as like uh, malware analysts analyze new samples, they're looking for something unique in the binary usually to name th the malware. Um, so they'll use like a name like that, maybe out of a path, or they'll use some string that was, uh, you know, unique to the thing. Um, so uh, Kyle's showing here, um, you can see the path um, just above where he's highlighted is Y colon backslash uh, LSVN branches FinSpy. So this is not quite the PDB string, but it's a good example of malware using clear text strings. And I'll actually go and grab the PDB file here that was shown on this web page. If you take a look, this path actually appeared. LSVN branches, FinSpy 401, and it even shares that, hey, this is a boot kit. It's a 32-bit driver. They yep. built it uh, you know, using the uh, you know, uh, excuse me, release version of it. And here's bootkitdriver.pdb. So that's a great example of PDB strings showing up in malware. Another example I have this is a banking malware called Dyer. If I jump into the image here, we can take a look. Nice. C++ projects get Dyer. So those are two good examples of malware that were found you know, uh, by malware analysts that the name actually had came from not just what the authors called it, but uh, the PDB string that the analysts found and kind of were able to go backwards. So there's a very likely chance that in some of these malware, the same internal name that the author calls it is the same name that the outside calls it because of leaks or poor OPSEC by the actors behind this. Yeah, yeah, and if the author is not careful, um, they may leave behind debug strings. So, you know, um, for anybody who's not familiar with development, sometimes you want to print out things um, when you're debugging something, when you're testing something, you want it to print out like, oh, hey, I just installed the bootloader hey, I just patched the process, whatever it is. Um, you know, if they forget to remove those strings before they release their malware because they're in a hurry or something, um, you know, those can, again, potentially attribute to, uh, you know, what it's doing and who's doing it. So another big one that I, I've found in the past is, uh, is domain names. Um, so there's a lot of malware that... Um, and this is not, not so much toward the malware authors, but actually the people running it, uh, which may or may not be the same people. But, you know, having malware A and, and, um, and victim foo, right, and somebody sees that, does the analysis on it, and then to find, you know, uh, a different victim with a different piece of malware, but that's still talking back to the same domain name, now I can coordinate and say, okay, well, whoever breach these two victims is using the same domain, they're controlling the same DNS server, that's probably the same actor, right? So then I can start to do attribution that way and say, okay, well, the same person who hit uh, Bank of America also hit Citibank. No, that's fair, right? It's, um, you know, that idea of not keeping those lines clearly separate. Uh, we use the word tradecraft often to talk about cybersecurity tradecraft. 
But in the human intelligence world, you have to manage your personas, right? To make sure in case you're managing human assets or spy versus spy, that every story and every detail that I put together about one person couldn't be linked to my operation or my human intelligence gathering to overhear on, you know, person B. That way, person A and person B who are both working for me, that I'm their handler for, I could then get them to technically work for each other against each other, and they neither of them would have an idea that they're working for me. And we're, what we're talking about here is examples of malware, where even though we haven't attributed back to the actual actor, we were able to see that they had crossed their streams. For one target, they compromised the host using certain URL. On a separate target, they used the same URL, so it's very likely that it's the same person behind both of those. Right. And this, this is one of the ways occasionally you'll see reports where they'll say, uh, you know, new malware sample by this actor. And a lot of times ways like uh, things like this are how they determine that, hey, look, this is not the same sample that was used to compromise uh, both victims, but um, they had things in common like uh, domain names, um, compilation dates, languages. Uh, so like when you compile a binary, a lot of times the compiler will put in there extra information about what's the current language set up on the machine you were compiling on? Was it Russian, Chinese, English? Um, you know, so all, all little things like that are just little pieces to the puzzle uh, that people try to use to, to build a bigger picture. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so Chris, all of these things that we just talked about with malware data, so whether they're strings, crypto keys that were reused, domain names that were shared, uh, these are all things that can happen as accidents if somebody is not careful while developing their malware. But you can actually take this a step further. Rather than just being a, you know, an attribute specific to the file, sometimes there's indicators from the actual tool chain that the malware author is using to build these malware samples. So that's whether it's an exploit, whether it's a malicious PDF, um, maybe it's actually a stage two implant with all kinds of awesome sexy capabilities. And this is generally called uh, you know, development tool marks. Think about it like if you were to use a specific shaped shovel to dig in the ground, that would leave a tool mark behind that would be indicative of what the shape that shovel was. Or for instance, if a bullet fired down a certain barrel, that barrel could leave grooves on the bullet that could trace it backwards. Well, in the same way, the tool chain or the techniques used to build this malware can also leave marks behind. So I know yeah. we've just thrown a lot at you guys, but if you take a step back and realize there's humans behind each one of these actions, maybe it'll make more sense what we're about to share with you when it comes to these development tool marks. Say right. if Chris here woke up every morning and had to write malware. You know, he's the greatest implant author this side of the Mississippi. Chances are he's not rewriting his code every morning. It's inefficient. He's got things to do. So what we're able to use is that finite delta of time that Chris is not changing his software up and he's reusing his same techniques. And we can use those details to learn a little bit more about Chris. What's his build environment and what, what's he doing? So Chris, now that I kind of segued in there, what, what's the first thing you think of when you think about somebody's like, uh, maybe their development style or their, uh, you know, the, the tool marks that could be left behind. What's the first thing you think of when you look at a, a, a malware sample? Um, probably crypto. I mean, crypto is yeah. hard, right? Crypto is very specific. Um, the code is hard. If you have a bug in your crypto, you're going to have problems. So if I spend, you know, a month writing some crypto thing where I do a key exchange and all that, I don't want to throw that away, right? Because then I got to start over again. It's likely to have the same bugs I had last time. And then I got to figure it all out. So I might try to just reuse that crypto portion again. And so if I reuse the same code again, now you can say, okay, look, what's the chance that somebody else uh, wrote the same crypto code, wrote it the exactly the same? It's pretty low. So if you can match the crypto in two different samples together, you can likely say that, look, these were the same actor or group of actors who just reused their code. It gets even more interesting when not only is the routine the same, but maybe the bug is the same too. Crypto is a good yeah. example of where it's yeah. hard to implement right. So when you find stuff like that, the same bug, maybe you can use that to attribute the software back to a certain group. 
However, yeah. open source software and public examples throws a wrench into that. You know, um, if I just grab this open source library that had the same bug, it wouldn't matter that you know Chris using you know uh, what is it, sodium chloride is is that one of the salt? That's what I'm thinking of. Uh, salt, some yeah. libraries. If there's a bug in salt and there's a, a bug in you know uh, the way that I've used it and the way that Chris has used it, well, it's not tying it back to Chris and I are part of the same bad guy regime or something like that. It just right. tied it back to the same open source software. Right. Yeah. So like in situations like that, you kind of have to step back and, and go up one more layer and say, okay, well, they use this open source generic tool and they use this open source generic tool. Uh, but what can we say about it from a higher level? We can say, um, are there any other samples that use this same collection of tools? Are there any other samples that use the collection of tools in the same way? Yeah. Um, did they use the same crypto keys? Yeah, uh, we, we've definitely seen some of that uh, recently, uh, some of the attribution of supposedly these malware samples were using the exact same crypto keys or, you know, uh, I, whether they were IVs or the actual crypto keys, I don't recall, but that's something that could be taken into consideration. Um, we were talking about that third party library. Well, if I decide to statically link that library in and Chris is living off the land and dynamically linking, that's one of those you know, tool marks that we could actually tell. Like not only do these two pieces of malware work differently, but the way that they're linking doesn't work the same. Um, and maybe that would be a good indicator that you're dealing with more than one person coming at you. Yep. So I, we talked about helper libraries. Um, I have a, a large background in software development. Anybody who's been in a software development shop knows that the build environment is king. And it's all about setting up your build environment. And heaven forbid anybody changes the build environment. So sometimes you can leverage indicators from the actor's build environment against them. For instance, what compiler flags are they using? Um, are they doing anything crazy with you know, any of the compiler options? Do they have their language setting? You know, or any of the flags they're using for the linker or the compiler that generate code in a certain way? None of that being bulletproof, but it's just another indicator that could be used for attribution. Right. Um, one of my favorites, how does somebody handle exceptions? That's actually very rarely touched, but when you write malware, you can't have an exception handler throwing pop-ups to your users saying, ah, something went wrong. Yep. So it's really interesting to start seeing, hmm, are they using a generic way of handling exceptions? Or did they roll their own exception handler, which works with their calling convention or something along those lines? And maybe that's a great way to attribute malware to a certain actor. Right. So, uh, so stepping back one, one more layer, right? Okay, so we talked about um, the metadata. We talked about the binary. If we go back one more layer and we start to actually talk about some of the more generic, higher level techniques that malware authors are using, things like persistence, um, like what kind of stuff are, or do we see there? Yeah, so I, this is one that's really interesting. The reason I say it's interesting is thus far, not many actors have deployed an attack capability, whether it's for gathering information or actually doing destruction, that uses different techniques. So for instance, if I was persistent and I always ran with the run key, most of the time I'm going to continue making sure my malware automatically starts with that run key using a similar type of maybe a random value name or something along those lines. And I'm not going to change it till it stops working. Um, that's interesting because if they use something more specific, like maybe they're using a WMI action script event handler, or they're using, maybe they're replacing a service executable, a legitimate Microsoft service, and they just replace Microsoft's executable with their own. Well, that could be something that is a great indicator of compromise that helps you maybe get closer into this attacker's mind. You know, not only, hey, this is how he builds software. This is how he sends spam. But when he does send spam, this is how he wants to live on the box, not to be, you know, uh, not to be detected easily. So Chris, um, are you aware, I mean, I've seen one or two malware variants that when they start getting caught by antivirus, they roll over to a new persistence mechanism. But have you seen many malware variants that, you know, carry like three or four, 10 different ones on, you know, that they carry around with them? I've seen samples with maybe like two, 
um, where they'll usually install one and then one is like a backup. The yeah. idea being, like you said, if, if antivirus is there and says like, oh, hey, this is, you know, whatever, or if somebody runs a registry cleaner and it removes that thing, uh, you know, they still want to, you know, maintain their persistence. So they might have like two, but, um, you know, persistence mechanisms are somewhat difficult to come by. Um, you know, there's not a lot of them that aren't known. So it's, it's really a matter of, um, you know, trying to use one and trying to make it look normal, not suspicious. I, I agree. And uh, it's not like a binary that you can just recompile or run it through a packer and get a new hash. There's a right. finite amount of these resources. And that's probably the reason we don't see actors just quickly rolling through a dozen or two dozen new persistence mechanisms. Um, but maybe that'll change. Maybe we'll see more and more of that. Uh, the next one, Chris, now that we've moved from the actual you know, uh, ways that this malware is being created more to the tradecraft itself. Um, how about processes? Just the way, like, some type of process is going to have to make communication. You want to yep. share anything that you've seen, you know, or different ways that you could attribute a malware family or an attacker back to maybe, a, you know, an overarching organization behind it, just talking about the way that processes communicate? Um, a lot of them have to deal with, uh, like, like, Actually, the communication, a lot, a lot of things will try to pretend that they are like HTTPS streams, uh, you know, because they're encrypted. So you can't really view the data. Like if you open your web browser and go to like HTTPS colon slash slash Google dot com, it's all encrypted. So even if you were to like open up Wireshark or something and look at the data, it's going to look like garbage. So from an attacker's perspective, I can use that to my advantage. And I can just encrypt my data and just wrap it in a very simple thing that makes it look like HTTPS request uh, or response. And then most applications are just going to say, oh, yeah, whatever. This is fine. Like, we can't figure that out. Um, you know, so then you kind of have to go to the next level and say, like, okay, is this the, the process that is sending this? Does that make sense, right? Like, if it's Chrome.exe or iExplore.exe or Firefox.exe, that probably makes sense. However, if it's Notepad.exe... <laughs> Uh, you know, foobar.exe, that might not make as much sense and, and it might be something you should go look into. Gotcha. I, I take it you could also tailor that back. Uh, you know, if I was a malware family that only used the Microsoft bits, you know, to download my files, that's something unique about me. That's something right. that even if I can't tie that back to, you know, who's the person behind it, when it comes to identifying the threat that's faced at my organization, by focusing on that tradecraft, oh, they're using the background intelligent transfer service or whatever the heck MITS stands for. Uh, yeah. No idea. You know, that, that's something that you can actually start looking for, right? Start tying it down until that actor try, you know, switches up their tradecraft. Yeah. You know, yeah there's, uh, there's some other tradecraft in here, um, things that we were going to talk about, like covert store. So maybe as a, a malware, if it's – Decently advanced, it'll be um, modular so that um, you know it doesn't have to come with all of the pieces, and it can receive a new piece and, and execute that. So it's got to store that code somewhere. It's probably going to store files and configuration somewhere. So um, you know, then you can start to look at like where do they store that? You know, are they storing that in a registry key with binary data? Are they trying to store that into a a, a, a sector on the hard drive that they've marked as bad? Um, you know, yeah, do they just store that system? Right. Do they store that in um, uh, in one of those? What are those streams that you can do in like in Windows? Oh, you're talking about the just the alternate data streams. Alternate data streams. Yes. Yes. Exactly. You know things like that. So then you can say, okay, well this this malware uh, did this, this, and this, and stored its data in a malware or in an alternate data stream. Do we have any other pieces of malware that did similar things and used same alternate data streams and, and et cetera? And then so then you can again join two up and really your attribution is going to depend on how many things are similar and how many things are different. The more things that are the same, the better likelihood that it is that, uh, you know, that the two different pieces of malware that you have are the same and therefore that the actors are the same. So I would encourage anybody that's either in an incident response or an, uh, maybe even just IT system administration, network engineer position who could be responding to malware like this to focus on maybe attributing the tradecraft that uh, would be harder to replicate. Uh, a good example of this or, you know, is maybe shell code, for instance. If you're a guy that's looking at stuff across the wire and you're watching shell code all day long and you've got SSL stripping and everything else, 
shell code is a great thing that you could signature because the reality behind it is exploits are fickle. And you know, maybe you can make your own encoders that make that harder to take a look at, but the reality is there's only so much change you can do to shell code. Similar to we said, there's only so much change you can do to the persistence mechanisms, um, even stuff like anti-forensics techniques. There's only so many different ways of detecting, hey, am I in a VM? Or hey, has somebody attached a debugger to me? So I would encourage anybody doing that stuff to leverage on the uncommon things. You know, right. Leverage these items that could allow you to better know your adversary. Some of this stuff is, is uh, difficult. Um, we don't, I, don't, I don't want us to sound like, like we're just saying, like, oh, it's, it's, it's simple. Some of the things that Kyle's talking about is um, something you really only get from experience, having done this for a while. Like, uh, if you've never done this before, you're not going to be able to open up a malware sample and say, oh, the way they did this is unique. <laughs> right? You're really going to have to have said, like, oh, okay, I've seen 300 malware samples, and they all just checked for, you know, is it that was simple? This one's doing some weird stuff. Like, what is this? Those are the type of things that we're talking about, things that are unique, but um, without having any kind of background or experience, it's going to be hard to determine what's new and unique and, and what's just old hat. So, so, okay. We've got um, network indicators, Chris, and then we've also got, uh, you know, a whole section that we can run through on actual examples of this, as well as the, you know, elusive false flag operations, which is essentially going to potentially blow away a lot of the indicators we've already suggested. So, yeah, where so do you want to go, Chris? You want to touch network indicators real quick? Yeah, let's just run through network indicators real quick, and we'll get to the, uh, to the more interesting stuff. All right, Chris. Uh -huh. I found this IP. I, I looked up on one of the, you know, RIPE or ARIN databases that this IP is affiliated with FUBAR Company. Does that mean FUBAR Company is hacking me? No, not, not necessarily. I mean, it, it might mean that they're hacked too and they're being used as a, a redirection. Um, it also might be spoofed, although if there's two-way traffic, it's not likely that it's spoofed. Um, so, no. I mean, you see a lot... Um, where somebody will compromise uh, a web server, and instead of having the malware call back directly to them, it will call back to the compromised web server that, that will then redirect the traffic to somewhere else. And, and that's just really a um, misdirection that they're throwing in there so that, you know, if the malware was really calling right back to me, then it would be pretty obvious and pretty easy for somebody to track me down. So as an attacker, I want to add as many layers of uh, indirection and misdirection that I can. All right, fine, fine, fine. Uh, IP address is no, no good. It's an indicator no. of compromise, but you know can't attribute it back. What about DNS records now? That, so that DNS, DNS is a it's a little bit better. Um, I mean, when you when you purchase a domain name, generally you're the only person who can change it, um, point it to different places. So if you see multiple DNS names across multiple attacks that are the same, it's a good likelihood that those uh, people are also the same. Um, one of the things to look at in uh, DNS records that I guess some people maybe uh, don't think about as much is who is records. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people, when they register the domain name, they'll pay for one of these services, which um, allows them to basically uh, hide their details behind something. So instead of, uh, if I buy a domain, instead of putting my phone number and address and full name in the who is record for who owns the domain, uh, instead what gets put in there is the address of this company and their phone number and stuff. Um, and if somebody really needs to get a hold of me through that, they can call the company, and then the company will call me and say, like, hey, look, do you want to talk to this person? Um, but not everyone pays for those services because, like I said, they're, they're paid for. So um, prime example of this is, uh, what was it, uh, Silk Road V2. Um, so the guy who set up this, the next version of Silk Road after Silk Road was taken down, he registered a domain name under his actual name, actual address, phone number, so... It made it very easy for the police to show up at his house and arrest him. So, um, you know, a lot of times you look at who is data and it's just bogus, but sometimes, sometimes it's real. So, yeah, I think uh, Saffron Rose, Flying Kitten, some of those uh, reports that Mandiant and CrowdStrike released, uh, it was really interesting because they were able to leverage certain indicators within the who is data. So, they found a beaconing URL and they had this, you know, suspicion this has probably been going longer than just that one URL. And because the actor did not protect that domain who is information, 
And albeit maybe they used a bogus email address, you know, shady at badguy.ru. He happened to use the same shady.badguy.ru on so, uh, several of the other callback domains that they were using. So they were actually able to leverage in this example that type of attribution that although they didn't know the person behind it, they still were able to say, ooh, here's 15 other domain names that could be receiving callbacks, which helped their incident response. It helped them identify which of their customers were infected. And there's no reason that some of those similar capabilities couldn't be done. Um, not to plug domain tools, but they're probably the biggest that you can go out there. If you see a domain and you can look through the history because maybe it's private today, but domain tools allow you to pay a small amount of money to find out what did it look like when it was first registered. I can't tell you how many times we've seen examples of actors that will register a domain, use semi-legit creds or something that's maybe too close to home, change the domain registration, and then later make it private. And if you think about the scenario I just played out, something like domain tools or any other historic who is provider would allow you to do to say, let me roll back one stage. Ooh, all right, they changed it to this. Now let me roll back to when it was first registered. Now I've got twice as many indicators that could help me identify who might actually be behind this. And then collectively, you can browse the whole web using tools saying, show me the other who is data that has some of this information. Yep. Um, do you want to talk about some of these recent attributions, like the, uh, the Democratic National Co Committee breach or the oil rig campaign? Ooh, they're both sexy. Um, we're yeah, running um, already at 42 minutes in, so. Yeah, so we're running low on time. Um, I will go through and I will see if I could point out some of the more critical pieces. We already talked a little bit about Cryptia's blog that seemed to call out that, hey, there are some points in this malware that yes, the malware was commonly known associated with a similar actor. They had some background. And we demonstrated here that the, you know, one of the documents had a Cyrillic name within it. And a lot of folks, you said, you know, use that as a testament. Part of the metadata said, oh, this is likely, not only is this malware affiliated with a likely Russian actor, maybe this extra Cyrillic character is, you know, the smoking gun behind it. Um, that data can be modified. I think what was really interesting is the way that some of these companies have gone about actually, you know, saying, hey, this is who did that. Um, and the, the two that I want to call out, the very first one is going to be Kaspersky's Dooku 2 report. So I'm going to pull that up and share that here because they actually have a section under here of where they call out exactly. This is what we think for attribution, but they stop short of maybe saying, oh, this is why it's got to be the way that it looks. So I'm pulling that up now. Sharing the screen. All righty, Chris, you see that? Yep, looks good. So guys, this is the Dooku 2 report by Kaspersky from 2015. We take a look under the section attribution. So it's interesting in this attribution section, I won't read it to you, but they actually talk about in this scenario, Kaspersky was compromised by some actor. And what's interesting about a lot of this is they said, hey, a lot of these samples had strings that despite using super sophisticated uh, capabilities in their malware, they left behind obvious strings. For instance, ugly gorilla. Or another one was this whoop whoop black hats Romanian anti-sec. Uh, you know, <laughs> Romanian anti-hacker. Nice. Um, this could indicate and kind of gives you a heads up that there's no reason that an actor, you know, just because we're talking about attribution right here, why could an actor not modify that data in advance? So using Cryptia's example, why could a Spanish hacker not have added Cyrillic characters and straight up used tradecraft that looks similar or maybe domains that uh, could have once been used by Russian hackers uh, to throw that you know, same thing under the bus or same, that same actor under the bus. And this was traditionally called false flags. So I'm gonna keep it going here uh, of what we're talking about. And Kaspersky actually calls out, nevertheless, such false flags are relatively easy to spot, especially when the attacker is extremely careful not to make any other mistakes. So this is an example that hmm, maybe the actions here seen in the Dooku 2 attack were a poor false flag operation. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen so we can go back and talk and look like people here. <laughs> but there's no reason that that 
couldn't have been something maybe well planned out. Chris, if you and I were doing an engagement, we've done in the past adversary emulation engagements where a customer has hired us or an agency has hired us to simulate a specific actor's capabilities. So we will actually go as far as saying, I need to make sure that I'm using the same protocols they're using. Yep. I'm calling back in these network intervals that look in a reasonable amount of callback frequency as this actor had been used in another attack. On top of it, maybe I'll register a separate domain, but I'll use similar strings in that domain who is to give the impression that this is what I'm doing. Um, if the malware happens to be built off of like publicly available source code, like when Zeus source code was released or Carburp, um, there's no reason that I couldn't tailor my same capabilities to look like that. You know, Chris, if I had to choose a persistence mechanism and I was emulating a certain actor, uh, C Daddy was one that was in the news recently. They mm -hmm. used WMI event consumers. Yep. There is no reason that if I was emulating that actor, I wouldn't do the exact same thing, especially because that tradecraft is public. So when I said earlier we were going to jump into attribution, we absolutely wanted to expose as much as possible today. Here's all the indicators that could be useful to attribute this back to a certain actor. But we wanted to make sure that we start leaving off on the foot that not all of these indicators are perfect. And if you have a sophisticated actor who has enough time to plan, there's no reason that a false flag operation isn't more than pl plausible for almost any operation. Right. right. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of this goes to the point that we really kind of wanted to drive home was, um, you you can't really trust everything, but more to the point, do you care, right? If if I'm a network security defender at an enterprise, I'm not law enforcement. I don't have the ability to extradite people. Do I really care that it was some hacker in Croatia, right? Like I, I don't really care. What I care about is um, much higher level stuff. I care about. Uh, you know, what domains were they using so that I can blacklist those. Um, I might care about um, some of the signatures of the binaries they were using. What was their naming convention? Um, what registry keys did they use to persist? Because I might have found one or two infections, uh, but are those on other boxes in my network, right? If I know that they're using this persistence mechanism, this registry key, this service name, et cetera, I can go and start looking at my other boxes on my network and say, you know, is this somewhere else? Because what I might find is that I found an old binary, but on these other hosts over here, there's a new binary. Um, and then I can share that with other companies and, you know, then they can go and start looking as well. So we don't, I don't think it matters so much for 99% of people that they can't pinpoint to actual human who it is. I mean, if you're law enforcement or intelligence agency, yeah, you probably really care who's on the other end of the keyboard. Um, but from a defender perspective, it doesn't matter to me, I don't think. Yeah, I, I don't see this helping any IT staff or incident response, you know, that belongs to a security operations center at a company. This isn't going to help your company make more money. This right. isn't going to help your company do more business. And that's what your company is paying you for in reality, is to make sure the company stays profitable. So I would suggest that attribution is hard. There's no doubt about it. Yep. Getting it down to the name, social security number, and as Greg Hoagland said it, the GPS coordinates that you could drop a bad uh, bomb on a bad guy, you know, that might be overkill for 99% of us. However, taking a step back and looking at the actual tradecraft, hence the reason this whole show is called Tradecraft Tuesday, exposing the tradecraft used by hackers. We're preaching on some of this because Every time your company is infected with a malware infection or you know, a larger breach, that is an opportunity for you to harvest the realest actionable intelligence you're going to find. You could pay endless amounts of money for action intelli or, excuse me, intelligence streams or threat intel, but I'm willing to bet your network has all the threat intel you actually need and that's directly relevant to you if you know the tradecraft to start searching for. Yeah, I mean, these are the things that essentially that, uh, you know, threat intel feeds are, are built on top of to say like, hey, look, we're seeing some actor who, you know, did this before. They're now using this new service name. They're now dropping this new binary. They're now calling back to this new domain, et cetera. That, that 
that's what you're going to get in a thread intel feed. Yeah, and when you have this thread intel, like, yeah, you could sit on it, but maybe you can trade it. Maybe you can give it away publicly. You know, we all benefit this way. We wouldn't have been able to talk about most of the techniques today, especially the detailed examples like the Dooku attack. How would we have known that Romanian anti-hacker was a string within one of the drivers? We would have never known unless somebody published it. And I don't think there's any shame in that whatsoever. I think that's actually the step of where our InfoSec community is moving to. And I would encourage whether you're in a small company, a large company, a startup, or I don't know, some mega enterprise, there's no reason you shouldn't be sharing your thread intel. Whatever platform of choice, talking about it, worst case scenario, blog or be like us clowns every Tuesday hassling you guys, trying to educate the audience on what's out there. Yep. So Chris, that's, that's the end of my attribution rant. You got anything else to add to this? No, I mean, I think you, I think you covered it. Attribution is hard, and it, it's not a, it's not black or white. It's many levels of gray in between, and um, so just try to learn what you can from it, benefit, and uh, hopefully it'll help you protect yourself better in the future. Oh, and when I get the tweet later today that says, "Sorry, our network is rock solid and secure, and we're not infected whatsoever," what should we do? This is where red teams and purple teams come in. There's no reason you can't simulate an attack yourself. Pick a, I don't know, actor du jour, grab their trade craft, and see if you can get management approval to say like, oh, okay, we're going to affect this small, maybe unimportant system, maybe an important system, and actually have a war game between each other. Test yourself internally. All right, Chris, I'm done. We're 53 minutes into it. Yep, I think, I think we got our ranting out, so. Yeah, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. We've got live chat open. Um, no questions for here. I'm going to check Twitter real quick. Chris. So if, you, um, if you're watching and you, and you disagree with anything we've said um, or if we missed some important points, uh, you know, hit us up on Twitter or even better, um, you know, join Slack and, and throw it in there. If, you, um, if you're trying to join Slack, um, you can do it through HamsterPad um, or alternatively you can uh, tweet at or DM myself or Kyle or Tradecraft2s. Um, and we'll drop you an invite, um, and you can join the Slack. The Slack is not meant to be uh, like any kind of private thing or whatever. We we kind of want everybody to join, but um, it's not. Slack doesn't have the feature where we can just like enable anyone to join. So you know, everyone has to be invited, but uh, the invites are not close held. They're for everyone. So if you want to join, let me know. And worst case scenario, you can catch up with Chris and I this August at Black Hat. We're training there. We'll be attending the talks. We'd love to catch up with you guys uh, and actually put some face-to-face -face time with you out in Vegas if you're there. Yeah. Oh, you know, we should, uh, we should do a live show for Vegas. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, we should do it. All Let's right, Chris. See. See if we can I'm going to sign up. off. All right. All right, well, thanks for uh, another episode of Tradecraft Tuesday, guys. We hope you join us every Tuesday at noon Eastern time to help us expose hacker tradecraft. I'm Kyle Hansloven. This cool guy here is Chris Bisnett. All right. See you next time.